Do me a favor. On the count of three, I want everybody to yell, I'm blessed. You ready for this? All right. One, two, three. I'm blessed. blessed. Come on. I'm blessed. That's what Jesus came to do, to give us a more fulfilling life, overflowing by the Spirit of God. And so here's what Jesus stated. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. It states, then on the most important day of the feast, which is the last feast. What feast is this? This is the Feast of Tabernacles. Here's what's interesting about this, okay? Jesus speaks to the crowd on the eighth day. This is the last day of the feast. They're celebrating this feast because they're remembering how God provided for the Israelites in the wilderness. And they're honoring God because he provided them with this water. Remember, God provided the Israelites with water from the rock. So on the last day of this celebration, now understanding this, Jesus stood up and shouted out to the crowds, all you who are thirsty can come to me, can come to me and drink. Believe in me. Now listen to the wording here. So that rivers of living water can flow through you. They will burst from within you, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scriptures say. Jesus is stating it like this. Just as God has promised, the Son of God stands before you. That's what Jesus is declaring, even though he's know, he knows that he's about to go to the cross very, very soon. But he's describing to the people, you've been chasing the wrong things. You've been living for the wrong things. The overflowing water that you're looking for is right here. I stand before you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. So how do we know that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit? Well, let's look at the next verse. Jesus was prophesying about the Holy Spirit. It's pretty pretty clear right there. The believers were being prepared to receive, but the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out upon them because Jesus had not yet been unveiled in his full splendor. This was an amazing truth. Jesus is telling the crowd, I got a better way for you to live. One that's overflowing with the spirit of God. I'm going to die for your sins. You're going to be redeemed. And know that the spirit of the Lord will always be with you. But here's the problem. Not everybody believed him. They heard this promise. And just like many of us today, we hear about a better life. We're like, okay, what's the gimmick? You know, what does that mean? Is it, is it really true? Because I've heard a lot of things from this world. Jesus is not of this world. And so he's giving us new revelations instead. And so there were people there that could have had their lives changed. Who could have had their life saved forever, but they didn't believe his words. John chapter 7, verse 40 and 41. When the crowd heard Jesus' words, some said, well, he's just a prophet. Others said that he is the Messiah. But others said, how could he be the anointed one since he's from Galilee? They were judging him because of where he came from. Have you ever had that happen to you? Somebody judging you based upon your family? I know where you come from. I know what your house was like. I know what your family was like, the dysfunction that was in your house. Or, hey, I saw you in the newspaper five years ago. I know what you've done in the past, but you know what you could say? Yeah, but that's the old me. And the old me is dead. I'm not that person today. I'm alive through Jesus Christ. The living waters are flowing through me so you can see my testimony. I'm changed. Because of Jesus, because of what he's speaking over my life, I'm blessed. I just had you shout it. The reason I had you shout it is because I want to ask you this question now. Do you believe it? Some of you would nod your head and say, yes, pastor, I've been through the trenches. I've been through the valleys. I've faced the giants. I'm facing one right now. Can God behead him? Because that would be great. But I know that he's going to come through. But at the same time, I know that there's people here because the Lord revealed this and placed this on my heart. There's people here. You don't like where you are right now. You don't like where you are in life. You're looking at your life, you feel like it's kind of going nowhere. You see people gossip about you, or maybe they're persecuting you, or maybe you have no direction right now. You wake up every single day doing the same thing, and you're bored with everything. You've given your life to your position and your job and your work. You come home, you barely talk to your spouse, you barely talk to your family, and you wake up and you do it all over again, and you know something's missing. Something's not satisfying you. Something's not fulfilling you. And so sometimes you buy a little extra or you go out and do some other things, but it still doesn't satisfy you. You're still hungry and you're still thirsty. And what I love about Jesus is just like the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus will meet you exactly where you are and say, hey, I got a drink for you. That's not like the drinks in this world. It's not gonna numb you. It's gonna fulfill you instead. 
Instead of intoxicating you like the world does just to try to numb your feelings, no, this is living on the inside and will bring you to life and will heal your wounds, will heal your heart, a life overflowing. And you may be saying, well, pastor, I want that life. I, I want to believe that Jesus has this for me. I want it overflowing, but I don't know how to make it happen. Here's the good news. If that's you today, it is not up to you to make it happen but it's up to you to believe that he can make it happen for you. That makes all the difference. I had a conversation just last week with somebody saying, I want to do all the right things, but I keep doing the wrong things. You ever felt like that? And so he was telling me that, you know, if I just make a checklist of these things, maybe I could become better. And I had to correct him. Listen, you can't be perfect on your own. But the closer you get to Jesus, guess what? Jesus starts to change your mind, starts to change your heart. The way you used to speak is not how you speak anymore. And so he starts to change your actions. Are you distant from Jesus right now? Is that why you feel like everything is kind of just so-so, not overflowing? Let me ask you this question. When's the last time you've seen the miraculous in your own life? When's the last time you saw God come through and, and heal or provide or do something amazing in your life? Because he's available for that every single day but are you chasing the world instead of Jesus? And so we have been studying over the last few weeks a Sermon on the Mount and looking at the very beginning where Jesus is teaching his disciples and teaching us about the Beatitudes. Do you remember what the Beatitudes are? They are the beautiful attitudes that honor God. But also Jesus was stating it like this to his disciples and to us. He was saying, change your attitude. Change your attitude. Attitude. Stop allowing anger and bitterness and jealousy to consume you. Notice the wording I'm using there because I'm gonna get to a point later on. But these emotions like to consume us and control us, and Jesus was revealing, hey, there is a better way. Instead of taking revenge on somebody, you can hand it over to the Father, because he's a just judge, and you can walk away in peace and still see a promise for your life. And so he said, the Beatitudes, there were eight Beatitudes. Blessed are you, the poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are meek, okay, because you would inherit the land. He, he kept speaking to them, you will go through this, but there's also a promise. But I couldn't help but notice that on the eighth beatitude, the, the last beatitude, Jesus spent a little bit more time on that one. And I want to show you to you, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. Jesus said, blessed, which also means happy are you. So happy are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is usually where Jesus stops, but he doesn't stop here. And he continues and he dives deeper. For blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and they say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for my sake. When they gossip about you, it means you're on the right track. When they say bad things about you because you're following me, hey, you're on the right track. The promises are right before you. Rejoice. And be exceedingly glad. Have you felt that emotion the last time somebody said something bad about you? (laughs) Did you rejoice and praise God? Well, so-and-so said they don't like you. Praise God. How did you respond? Maybe you said a different word that you can't say here. Maybe you chose a sentence where you said, you know, a lot of hateful words towards them. Maybe it was jealousy that came out of your mouth. Well, so-and-so doesn't know my life. And you started to go into the story to protect yourself. Don't do that. Allow God to protect you. Show a a different character that the world's never seen because that's how you become a light in the darkness. You're not supposed to act just like everybody else. You're supposed to be different because of Jesus. You're supposed to stand out. So be exceedingly glad. They're talking bad about me. Praise God. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they also persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Here's my encouragement for today, no matter what you're going through or what you're facing right now, because of what Jesus did on the cross, we have victory in our life. Some of you, though, you haven't understood correctly because you're trying to fight for victory. Listen, you're actually fighting from victory. You already have victory. But you have to believe that to know that it's true, that when you see the snake coming, you can say, get out of here. Because by the authority of Jesus, I can crush your head. That's right out of the book of Genesis from the very beginning. The promises of God over our life because of his victory on the cross. We can rejoice when people persecute you, when they gossip about you, when they come after you, when they betray you. Why? Because you know 
and you understand better things are still coming. But let me say it in a different way. The living water will keep you fresh at all times. No matter who's dry around you, the living water will keep you fresh. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. God made us free. Notice that statement right there. You didn't make yourself free. I didn't make myself free. God made us free from the power of darkness because that's where we were all heading. And he brought us into the kingdom because of his dear son. His son, Jesus Christ, paid the price to make us free. Because only in him, we had the forgiveness of our sins. By his strength, we can get back up. So the title of today's message is this, get up. Now I look to somebody next to you that you didn't talk to and say, get up. Don't literally get up, stay seated, but get up. No matter how many times you've been knocked down, no matter how bad it hurts, what they said against you, I know it hurts. But by Jesus, because of Jesus, you can still get back up. And you can still have faith and hope for the future. Just because you got knocked down doesn't mean you're out. But there's always a valuable lesson to learn. And so today, we're going to talk about uh, persecution. And I have three revelations that I want to share with you today that we can learn through these tough times. So let's go ahead and dive in. Point number one is this. The enemy is going to mock the truth. But don't worry because God is always going to reveal the truth. The enemy is always going to mock the truth, but God is going to reveal the truth. The enemy, Satan, is the father of lies according to the word of God. He hates the truth. He hates everything about the truth. Why? Because the truth sets you free. Because of what Jesus has for you, you don't have to be an addict anymore. But listen, if you believe, if you believe the lies of the devil, that you'll never come out of that, that's all you'll ever see. Some of us, we speak such negativity on our relationships. Well, I'm never going to be in a good relationship. Oh, my relationships are just going to go down, everybody. I, I can't trust anybody that I'm around. If you're speaking that, if you're looking for it, guess what? You'll find it. Because you're believing in the enemy when it comes to that. But Jesus said, no, I got a better relationship for you. I have a relationship right now that's available with the Son of God to know him in an intimate way. And then he's going to lead you to find other believers who will encourage you and pray for you when you feel down. Less relationships. That's what the Lord has for you, but you got to believe it to receive it, to walk into it. Otherwise, you always walk away. I want to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Um, this is a different translation, though, okay? This is the easy read version. I like, I like this version a lot. I like how it's worded. But it states it like this. Great blessings belong to those who suffer persecution. Don't miss this. For doing what is right. So great blessings uh, are for those who suffer persecution for doing what is right. God's kingdom is for them. So let me make this very clear. Living for Jesus, you're going to suffer. Oh, nobody wants to clap to that? <laughs> nobody comes in here and is like, all right, Jesus, I want to Like, can I suffer like one time out of the year? Like, do we have to do this every week? Can we schedule this in? Like, can I be prepared for it on my calendar? Um, you're going to suffer every day living for Jesus. Because you're sharing truth that sets people free, so you're making the devil angry. But let me reveal something else to you. Okay, you ready for this? Um, when you live for the world, you're also going to suffer. So you have to choose today your suffering. And you can suffer for Jesus and glory, or you can suffer for the world for selfishness instead. In fact, Peter stated it like this. First Peter chapter 4, 15 and 16. He said, you may suffer, but don't let it be because you have murdered You've stolen something because you made trouble, or listen to this, or because you try to control other people's lives. A lot of trouble comes into your life when you try to control people and tell them what to do all the time, try to force them to live the way you want them to live. But if you suffer because you are a Christ follower, don't be ashamed. You should praise God for that name. In other words, Peter is stating it like this, do not suffer because of stupidity. Because of selfish desires in this world. Do not suffer because you decided to post way too much on social media and now everybody knows your drama. Do not suffer because you decided to gossip about your friends and now nobody wants to hang out with you. Why? Because they don't trust you. Do not suffer because you cheated on a relationship another person you love doesn't trust you and doesn't want to be with you anymore. See, we can suffer because of worldly things, selfishness. 
And we do it all the time. And the thing is, here's what we do, though. We're like, God, how come it didn't work out for me? Where are you? And God's like, I've been here the whole time, but you don't see me. You don't hear me. You don't listen to me. You're doing your own thing, and then you blame me when it's not working out. You're suffering for the wrong reasons. Some of us, because we have no spiritual discipline in our life, we keep allowing problems to come over and over and over again. Here's a bigger problem, though. Some of us are so used to that, we don't know how to get out of it. And when life starts to go good, we go back into that that hectic world, that hectic environment, because it's familiar. What I'm telling you is this. You can become familiar with the bondage in your life. You can actually become friends with the demons in your life because they love to control you and lead you away from Christ. Don't suffer from stupidity, but instead suffer in glory because of Jesus. But this also raises another question, okay? So what blessings can come into our life by suffering? Because none of us like to suffer. So let me show you some revelations through Jesus, okay? The first thing I wanna show you is this. By suffering, we are reassured that God is with us. By suffering in our life, we are reassured that the Lord is with us, that he has not abandoned us, that he has not left us alone, and then you can trust that he will speak up on your behalf at the right time. How many of you right now, you need God to speak up for you because your mouth is about to get you in trouble? (laughs) You need God to show up, and guess what? He will, through testimonies, through confirmation, through other people, through what he's doing in your life. And I gotta be honest with you, yesterday, yesterday morning, the Holy Spirit changed like the whole first half of my sermon. Uh, it's almost like God was like, that's not good enough. Let's, let's move that out of the way. And I want to show you this. And this is such a revelation. It blessed me. I pray that it blesses you today. But look at this incredible story in John chapter 12. All right, Jesus is just days away from suffering at the cross, from being persecuted and hung on the cross. And it says in John chapter 12, 26 through 30, Jesus said, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. Notice the wording here, what Jesus is stating, meaning you have to be in the word of God to be in his presence. You have to worship his holy name to be in his presence. You have to be close to Jesus. You have to be where he is to know who Jesus is. And as a pastor, people come up to me all the time. Well, I feel a disconnect right now with God. Well, what are you doing? When's the last time you prayed in your house? Well, I pray in in church. Yeah, but when's the last time you prayed over your marriage, over your family, over your children, over your business? When's the last time you said, God, just have your way with everything because I'm sick of living for myself. It's not fulfilling. Jesus said, you got to be where I am to know me, to know my voice. Talk to God all day. I got to be honest with you. Sometimes I look crazy in my truck because I'm just talking to God. And I talk out loud, too. I'm like, ah, what you doing today? And we're just, we're just driving. But on the outside, I just look like I'm talking to myself. That's okay. Not every prayer has to be like this. But God wants you to be real with him. But he's also telling you, listen, by being where Jesus is, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to suffer. Uh, your friends are going to leave you. That's going to happen. Friends are going to walk away from you because they see a changed life. And again, they may judge you and try to condemn you and say things like, are you trying to be better than me? No, no, no. I'm not trying to be better than you. I'm just trying to be a better me through Jesus Christ. That's, 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 that's the goal that I have in my life right now. So Jesus said, you must be where I am to be my servant. Jesus went through a lot. Um, I told you last week that the Bible is very clear that Jesus faced all the same temptations that we faced, but he never sinned. He knew no sin. He is the perfect lamb of God. And so he showed us that there is always a way out no matter what Satan tries to put before you. But at the same time, Jesus has suffered in ways that we can't even imagine. Guess what? Jesus has been betrayed. Jesus has been hurt. Jesus has been condemned. Those that were closest to him left him. Those that pretended to be for him rejected him. Crowds came when they got what they wanted and they left him when he spoke the truth. He knew what it was like. And in fact, he had a dysfunctional family. Did you know that? Because his brothers didn't even believe that he was the son of God until after his resurrection. I kind of wonder in my head if Jesus showed up to them, to his brother saying, you believe me now? (laughs) And so here we see Jesus, the son of God, being so real before the father because he was teaching us a valuable lesson. And he said it like this. Um, First of all, anybody 
that is where Jesus is, following the Lord. He said, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. So the Father will honor you. But then he said, now my soul is deeply troubled. He's speaking this out loud. Should I pray, Father, that you save me from this hour? That you take me away from this? And remember, Jesus told Peter, put your sword away. If I wanted to, I can call over 12 legions of angels to come and rescue me. Just 12 legions of angels is 72,000 angels that could have came and and rescued Jesus. But he said, I could have called more than that. One angel in the book of 2 Kings took down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. That's the power of just one angel. Jesus could have called over 72,000 of them to rescue him. So he said it out loud. Should I say, Father, save me? Take this away from me? But then he made it very clear. This is the reason that I came, Father, to bring glory to your name. Jesus is revealing his commitment to the Father. But listen, he's also revealing his commitment to you. It's the only way that you and I can be saved from our sins. Jesus could have taken the easy road, the way out, but he chose to go to the cross because of how much he loves you. So don't ever believe the lie that you're worthless. Don't ever believe those who shout at you and condemn you. And some of you, maybe that's how you grew up. Maybe it was your own parents telling you that you were worthless, that you were nobody, but the word of God says differently. In fact, the word of God states it like this. Even if my mother and my father abandon me, the Lord never will. There's comfort there. And there's a joy when we believe. And so Jesus is declaring that he must suffer for a greater good. And again, sometimes God is going to assign suffering in your life for a greater good. And we pray to God all the time, take me out of this suffering. God's like, no, 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 you haven't learned the lesson yet. If I just let you out, you're going to go back to your addictions, back to your old way of life, back to the pit of hell. I'm trying to rescue you and teach you something better, something amazing for your life. He said, Father, I do this to bring glory to your name. Now, now, listen, something very supernatural took place. Then it says, then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. The heavens opened up and the voice of the Father spoke from the sky. Those that were with Jesus in this moment were actually witnesses of the Father speaking. They heard his voice. Listen to this. When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder. While others declared an angel had spoken to them. Then Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. Before I get into that, let me ask you this question. How powerful is the voice of God? You ever thought about it? What's it sound like? What would it be like? Um, It's actually pretty scary. According to the Bible, Job chapter 37, 4 and 5, after the flashes of lightning, you can hear his roaring voice. He thunders with this wonderful voice. And while his voice thunders, the lightning flashes continue. God's thundering voice is amazing. He does great things that we can't understand. In the book of Exodus, when Moses is speaking to God on Mount Sinai, you know what the Israelites said? They said, Moses, you go. (laughs) You you go ahead and talk to God and, and come back and tell us what he said. Why? Because they heard the thunder. They saw the lightning. They saw the cloud that was on the mountaintop, and they were afraid because when God speaks, he demands attention because he brings freedom in our life. And so these people were able to witness this. But why did Jesus say it like this? How come Jesus said, this was for your benefit, not mine? Here's why Jesus stated it like that. Because he knew where he was going. And he knew the purpose. But now all these people around him would witness the power of God and hear for themselves that he was the son of God and that this would free them. They couldn't deny it. They heard it come from the sky. Did you know that three times... Uh, The audible voice of the Father spoke to Jesus, and there were witnesses of this. The first time was at the baptism. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. John the Baptist was a witness of this. He also talks about the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove from the sky. The heavens opened up. Now, the second thing that we see out of the Bible is the transfiguration. And some of you may be saying, what is the transfiguration? Okay, um, I don't know if you've ever heard it in this term. It's, it's called Shekinah glory. 
and it's the glory of God. God is light. God is love. And so Jesus brought uh, Peter, James, and John upon a mountaintop, and all of a sudden, he started to glow. And as he glowed, uh, Moses and Elijah appeared right next to him. This was the Shekinah glory of God. They were mesmerized. Now, um, do any of you have a, a, a problem or struggle with holding back your mouth? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand right now, but, or maybe you know somebody, you don't have to point to them either at this moment. Um, but Peter had a problem controlling his mouth and he got overly excited. And so he starts to speak a little too much and he's like, oh my goodness, this is so crazy. He's like, I'll build you a tent. I'll build you a tent. Do you all want tents? And then all of a sudden the heavens opened up and it was almost like God said, shh, Peter, <laughs> be quiet. You're messing it up. The heavens opened up, Matthew chapter 17, verse five. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. And then the third time is what I just read to you. Days away from going to the cross, the people witnessed the voice of the father from the kingdom of heaven. God will always speak up for your benefit in the right way. And like I said, sometimes it's confirmation, sometimes it's a testimony, sometimes it's in a supernatural way that nobody can deny. But the second thing that I want to show you is this, through persecution, we also receive the comfort of God. But that's not what the devil says. The devil will make you think, okay, if God loves you, why is he allowing you to suffer? If God is real, then why are people attacking you and why are people hurting you? Listen, sometimes... The only way to know healing is going through brokenness. The only way to have your heart healed is to have a relationship that fails. The only way to know how much you need God is to look in your pantry and say, oh Lord, please help me. <laughs> Sometimes we have to go through suffering to realize how broken we are without Jesus in our life. And so I wanna show you another example of Jesus pouring his heart out to the Father. It was the night of his betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane. I told you last week also in the last two weeks that Judas came, the scripture says that he came with a contingent of Roman soldiers, around 500 to 600 soldiers Judas showed up with. So Judas shows up with a squad, remember that, and he, and he also has weapons and they have torches and they're trying to get Jesus and Jesus sees them come and says, here I am. Like they were so shocked by this, they had asked twice, like, uh, we're looking for Jesus, here I am, <laughs> I'm ready to go, because Jesus was willing to go to the cross, but before that even happened, Jesus is pouring his heart out to the Father. And I want you to see what takes place. Matthew 26, 37 through 39. says he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And if you were to look at the word grief in the Greek, the definition of it would mean something like this. It means violent emotions. Emotions that are so violent, it, it hurts, it, it devastates you. It's, it's hurtful on the inside. His body was going in shock. According to the gospel of Luke, after his prayer, he was sweating blood. His body was going into a state of shock. Why? Because he knew how bad he would be beaten for us. Isaiah 52, 14, a prophecy spoken about how badly he would be beaten for us. It says, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human from his appearance. One would scarcely know that he was even a man, even a human being because of how bad he was beaten for you and I. But that wasn't the worst part of it. Jesus also knew as the perfect the Lamb of God, he was going to take upon all the sin of the world. Every time you told God, I know better. Because that's what we do when we sin. When we don't listen to the Lord, we're actually telling God, God, I know better than you. I know you're telling me to go over there and, and do that, but I got other things I want to do right now, so I'll listen to you later. Every time we reject God's will over our life, he took that upon the cross so that we ha wouldn't have to go to a pit. And, and hell for an eternity. You understand, heaven's real, hell is real too. In fact, it's actually called Sheol today. And hell is actually the burning lake of fire. That's what hell will be. It was prepared for uh, Satan and his demons, not for you. But when we reject God, it means that we 
accept what Satan has. And if you accept what the devil has, you also accept his punishment. And we choose that life for ourselves just because we think we know better than God because the world has told us something different from the word of God. Jesus knows all this is coming up. And so he starts praying and he went on a little farther and he bowed with his face to the ground saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And so a lot of times the symbolism here you see in the Old Testament, when you see a cup, if it's filled up, sometimes it represents the wrath of God, the judgment of God. It was supposed to be spilled upon us. This was supposed to be our drink. And Jesus said, no, I'll drink the whole thing so that none of you have to drink it. And all you have to do is believe in me. That's what Jesus is saying. I've taken the wrath for you. But he's being so real. He said, if it's possible, take it away. But I want your will to be done, not mine. And then I want to show you again something supernatural took place, but not in Matthew's gospel. It's recorded in Luke's gospel. Luke 22, 42 and 43. Again, he prayed the prayer, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then, look at the text here. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. And we see the same thing in the wilderness. When Jesus overcame temptation, we see it in Matthew chapter four, verse 11. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. And remember how Jesus overcame temptation? He quoted the word of God and he knew when the devil was trying to twist it just a little bit to make it sound right. He was able to overcome the enemy by the word of God and angels showed up. You have no idea. In the spiritual realm, what God is doing for you. Some of you would say, it's just a normal day. You have no idea. The demons try to cut your head off, (laughs) try to kill you, try to take out your marriage, try to take out your family, try to hurt your children. But God says, no, 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 I'm going to guard this house. I'm going to put a hedge of protection around this house. The enemy will not get in. The enemy will not hurt you. The thing is, you can still choose to open up a window. And you can still choose to open up a door when you do not listen to the word of God. He's trying to protect you from the enemy. But we know this peace. Have you ever wrestled with something? Maybe it's forgiveness. God, they don't deserve my forgiveness for what they said. I I should punch them in the face, not forgive them. Not do something nice for them. Lord, why should I ever forgive somebody like that? You wrestle with it in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, and it tears you apart. You are divided because you don't know if you want to trust yourself or trust God. But the moment you trust God, what takes place? And I see it over and over again. When somebody's able to finally forgive and hand it over to the Lord, because that's what forgiveness is, all of a sudden they say, there's a peace. Immediately, there's a, there's a peace because I've let go of something. You're holding on to a burden. That Jesus is saying, let go. You can't handle it. It will destroy you. It's an open door. For the enemy to come into your life, God wants to give you a peace and speak up for you at the right time for you to know that he's always with you, no matter what you're going through. So through persecution, we can receive comfort from God, the help from angels, all for a greater good. But point number two is really difficult to understand. We don't like this one when it comes to persecution. Um, Point number two is this. People will leave when it gets real. The crowds love to follow Jesus when he had something to give them. The crowds love to be around Jesus when he was healing them, giving them food, preparing things for them. But when he started to speak the truth, you got to submit your will to the will of the Father. Oh, they didn't like that part. And they would walk away. In fact, The closer you get to Jesus, the more the devil's going to try to attack you. And the closer you get to the cross, the more the crowd gets smaller. In fact, when you get to the cross in your own life, there may only be one friend still left out of all of your friends. And this is what we see in Jesus' life. Um, Matthew 5.11, now this is the New Living Translation, states it like this, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you. 
and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. They may not understand spiritual things. So they're going to mock you because they're only looking at the world and craving the physical instead of the spiritual. So let me show you this revelation. In in John chapter 6, we first see the most famous story of Jesus feeding the crowd of 5,000. Have you heard this story before? You can just kind of raise your hand if you've heard this story before. I want to reveal this, though. Jesus fed way more than 5,000. He actually fed around 10,000 to possibly up to 30,000 people. Because the 5,000 was only a number that was recording the men that were there. John 6, 10, the men alone numbered about 5,000. So they would have wives, they would have families, they would, they would have maybe siblings. And so there could have been anywhere from 10 to 30,000 people listening to Jesus. They loved Jesus. Why? Because he gave them some food, right? Sometimes we show up to church because we're like, hey, what, we can have food today. We got donuts, we got coffee, right? So they showed up. But a lot of us don't know this about the next part of the story. So Jesus leaves the disciples, he tells them to go across the Sea of Galilee. That's when the storm happened. And Jesus starts walking on the Sea of Galilee. And then they go to the other side to Capernaum. Well, the next day when the big crowd woke up, they're looking for Jesus. Like, what's on today's menu? (laughs) We're going to have fried chicken today. Is it going to be pizza? Jesus, where are you at? You're like, they're looking. And they can't find him. And so some of them take boats and some of them travel on the other side looking for Jesus and they find him in Capernaum. John 6, 24 and 25. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus or his disciples were there, they got into boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. And they found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? We've been looking for you. You're sneaky. (laughs) Jesus didn't answer their question. But instead, he answered a question they should have been asking to reveal what was truly important in their life. Guess what? Sometimes God does that with us, too. We're demanding God to answer our question. He's like, that's not the question you should be asking. You're wanting a relationship with somebody else, and you don't even know how to have a relationship with me. You're wanting me to forgive you, yet you're holding on to a grudge for over 10 years right now? You wanted me to use you, but you just want the position and the authority? You're not coming to Jesus for the right intentions. You're coming to him for the things that you want. And so Jesus revealed this in verse 26 and 27. He said, I tell you the truth. Big crowd. You want to be with me? Because I fed you. Not because you understood the miraculous signs, the spiritual things but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking eternal life that only the Son of Man can give you. Jesus was stating, you're wasting your life. Chasing the things of the world, chasing the things that won't satisfy. And a lot of us know how that feels because you're chasing something and you're not even happy. You're doing everything you said you would do, but you're still not fulfilled. You get into that position, believing that position was God. It would change everything. But you only received a few minutes or maybe a day of happiness, and it faded. Everything in this world fades. So Jesus is stating to them, listen, you're living for the wrong things. Come to me for the truth, the the living water that will never fade, that will keep you fresh. But again, every time Jesus speaks the truth of God's word, demonic critics like to come out and play. Again, uh, Satan hates the truth of God's word because it says it's free. And the Jewish experts came out to test Jesus, John 6, verse 30. And they said, show us a miraculous sign. All right, Jesus, if you want us to believe in you, what can you do? You hear the arrogance and those words? Jesus, what can you do? He's already provided for tens of thousands of people. What can you do? And we read that and we're like, that would never be me. But guess what? We do it. Jesus, if you give me the things that I want, then I'll start going to church. Jesus, if you just give me that race, then I'll start giving. But if you come to the Lord with the wrong motivations, guess what? You're going to be motivated to leave him when you get the things you thought you wanted. Until it fades. Because it will fade. Living for this world. Jesus understood that they weren't listening. So he made a statement that demanded attention. And I love how Jesus says things. 
Because some things, sometimes he says things that just catch you off guard. John 6, 51 through 53, he said, you know what? I need you to understand, I am the living bread. You're searching for bread? You're looking for this? I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer, so the world may have life, is my flesh. Now imagine at that moment what they were thinking. Did he just say, eat his flesh? Because they didn't understand. I imagine the disciples were discussing with themselves, well, I think we just lost our mega church, okay? Everybody's gonna leave now. Jesus is talking about eating his skin. That's great. Um, the people began arguing with each other what he meant. How can this man give us flesh to eat? They asked. So Jesus said it again. You know what I love about Jesus? He never backed down from the truth, no matter how many people it offended. Because it doesn't matter if it offends. All that matters is that it sets people free from the damage that they have believed from the lies of the world. The truth seems crazy. The, the word of God seems crazy to the world because the world doesn't understand because the world has believed so many lies. You can be set free is what he's stating to them. You could have eternal life within you. I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man, drink his blood, you, can have, you cannot have eternal life within you. Verse 55, my flesh is true spiritual food. My blood is true spiritual drink. All right, and as believers today, we know that Jesus was not literally talking about eating his flesh or drinking his actual blood, but he was pointing everything to the cross. Symbolism of what his body would go through for us to be saved of our sins and his blood being spilled. But I still gotta ask the question, then why did he say it like that? Why did Jesus say it in such a way that he knew that this large crowd who wanted to follow him would turn away because they would not understand? Here's why. Here's what Jesus was revealing in the spiritual world, okay? Because what you feed on is what you become. That's what Jesus was actually stating here. What you feed on is what you become. We are and you are what you eat, what you place into your body. Proverbs chapter 23, 2 and 3. Be careful to curb your appetite and catch yourself before you fall into the trap of wanting all that you see. Do not crave all the delicacies that the enemy places before you. Because he'll dangle all the things that your flesh wants, the appetites that you have. Don't crave these delicacies, for they may have another motive in having you sit at the table, meaning there are people that have agendas. Why did Jesus choose to say it like this? Um, because here's the truth. We're all feeding on something. And so as I was writing this and praying, I just heard from the Lord that a lot of people today in our culture today, what do we do? Mindlessly, mindlessly, scrolling, 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 instead of being in the word of God. Here's my question. What are we scrolling on? A feed. It's called a feed. So it's crazy that we read this and we're like, man, why did Jesus say it like that? But yet we live in a culture where we scroll on a feed. And what are we feeding ourselves? We're feeding ourselves content constantly. What is content? It's somebody else's opinions, somebody else's agenda, the way they're coming after you, the way they're coming after your family, the things that they want you to believe, the things that they want you to buy. This will make your life better if you just had this car and this house and had this life. It's so hard. Everybody looks perfect on Instagram. With all those filters, knowing that good and well before you took that picture, your whole family was fighting. <laughs> but then you all smiled for the picture. It's hard to even know what's real anymore, right? AI is getting pretty scary. Um, listen, after this, next week, y'all want to hear about Jesus coming back? Y'all want me to preach about Jesus coming back? That's what I'm asking. All right, come here next week, because that's where we're going. I got a standalone message on that. I'm going to show you some things out of the book of Revelation that I believe that involve AI and where it goes in our life. But we start to depend on these things. Why? Because we're feeding on it. You're being consumed by AI. And you can be consumed by a lot of different things. It could be your job or your entitlement or these things. And, and, but I'm noticing that we're feeding on counterfeits. We're feeding on fake love. We're feeding on fake views. We're feeding on fake followers. We're, we're feeding on fake Ideas of happiness. We're feeding on fake ideas of happiness. 
and we're wondering why we're still hungry. And then I got to share this. I feel it from the Lord. And I said it in the, the first service. Um, last night, my heart was broken because today we celebrate the risen king. And I, I saw this article that was shared that, um, that today has been proclaimed by our president that it is Transgender Visibility Day. And so let me make this very clear. Today is a day to see Jesus Christ risen from the grave. The word of God is going to be before our very eyes, but I want to make this clear. God doesn't make mistakes. He didn't make a mistake with you. He loves you and he created you for a purpose. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, the Lord is the rock. All of his work is perfect. Yes, all of his ways are right in everything that he creates, but you will never be satisfied or happy trying to be something that God never created you to be. But the only reason we start to believe these lies is because we feed ourselves with the agendas of this culture and this world. And so I'm telling you, as parents in the room, protect your house. Protect your children because it's in everything. Lies about everything, everything that the world says makes you happy. Change who you are. Don't have a marriage. Marriage is bad. Don't have a family. The devil is tearing up the family structure, causing confusion over and over again. Here's what I believe, though. The people of God are going to stand up, and there's going to be a great revival. And those that have even believed the lie will be transformed back as a son or a daughter of God. They will witness his love in a better way that they chased the world. The world couldn't fulfill them. But God, Jesus Christ, has something that will fulfill you today. It is a living water. It's the water you are looking for today. And so today, we proclaim Jesus Christ. Our eyes will look upon him and not the fakeness of this world, but you'll be persecuted for these things. John 6, 57, Jesus said, who feeds on me will live because of me. John 6, 60 and 61, here's what happened though. Many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. Who can accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to him, does this offend you? You don't like what I said? And then verse 66 states that at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him and only 12 were left. I just told you a crowd, up to 30,000 people were following him. 12 were left and Jesus said one of them was a devil. 11, 11 disciples who are fully committed to Jesus. And that's what a lot of us do. Jesus, I want the bread. I'll consume all of this. But I don't like everything. And, and sometimes I'm offended and I don't know if I want to submit my will over those things. And so what do we do? We say, that looks nice from the side. But you're still hungry over here. Some of us are like, let me share. <laughs> this, is, this is really cool. But you're not even consuming the word. You're not even consuming his presence. You're just looking at it from a distance. Some of us have believed the lie. Well, that looks great. When I'm older, you're not promised tomorrow. Jesus said he must be consumed by me. Everything about me. I want to show you one more thing, though, when it comes to communion. This is a revelation that God showed me, and uh, it's so good. Another thing about taking communion and remembering what the Lord has done, it means that you also believe not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but he's coming back for his church. Did you know that? According to the Jewish customs of marriage, a man would meet with his, his bride's father, get permission from the bride's father, then he would negotiate a price for her. He would put a down payment for her, as much as almost buying a house because of his love for her. So he would negotiate a price for her. Then when the father... And the, the, the son, the man, had an agreement with the price. Guess what they would do? They would pour wine in the cup, and the groom and the bride would drink it together as a sign of their covenant becoming one flesh. Here's what's really cool about that. Then the man would leave for 12 months. Like, what? Why would he leave for 12 months? He left for 12 months. Why? Because he went to go prepare his house for his bride. 
And so after 12 months, the man would come back, the groom would take back and take back his bride and show her the house. The church today, we are the bride of Christ. When you participate in communion, not only are you believing that Jesus is raised from the dead, you're believing he is coming back for his church, that we will be raptured up one day. Revelation 19, 7, let us rejoice and exalt in him, give him glory for the wedding day the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Jesus got closer to the cross. The crowds became smaller. Those who yelled Hosanna on Palm Sunday would soon yell crucify. Judas would be possessed by Satan, lead him to death. Peter would deny him three times. And at the foot of the cross, only one disciple would be there. Only one disciple, the disciple John, holding his mother. Isaiah 53, 5, but it was because of our rebellious deeds that he was pierced because of our sins that he was crushed. He endured the punishment that made us completely whole. And in this wounding, we found our healing. By his stripes, we have been healed. Why are you not believing that he came to give you a blessed life? Why are you putting so much into this world instead of the kingdom of God? This world is temporary. It's short. But one day you're going to be before the presence of God for all eternity. Either you will be there or you will be in hell. And it breaks God's heart to see people turn away from him. But I'm glad John was there because John became a witness. And when it looked like the devil had won, John heard these words, John 1930, it is finished. And this leads to my last point of the sermon today, which is this. When it looks like the enemy has won, that's when you can witness the power of God in your life. When it looks like everything has fallen apart, there's no way to take down the giant. There's no way to cast out the demon. There's no way to see healing in your life. God shows up and shows you that he is the God of the impossible. Acts 2, verse 24, Peter said, but God knew. (laughs) He knew, he wasn't surprised. Jesus wasn't surprised by Judas. He knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of the lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life for dead, death could not keep him in his grip. Death could not keep him down cannot keep Jesus from being resurrected from the grave. So let me make this very clear. The Jews did not have the power to put Jesus on the cross and the Romans did not have the power to put Jesus on the cross. Only Jesus had the power and he chose for himself to be placed upon the cross. I need you to understand that because it changes the whole story, the perspective that we have. Jesus himself chose to be on the cross. John 10, 18, no one can take my life from me, Jesus stated. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to. And I also have the authority to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. And when they went to go look for him in the tomb, Matthew 28, verse 5 and 6, the angel said to them, there's no reason to be afraid. I know you're here looking at Jesus or looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen victoriously. Just as he said, come inside the tomb and see the place where our Lord was lying. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Be consumed by me and let the truth set you free. You can live a more blessed life, not controlled by your old emotions, but to trust him and allow God to hold your hand. Some of you right now, you're so broken. You've been taking your hand away from God. But today, you can give over your hand again and allow him to lead you into every promise. He has not abandoned you. He's showing you his glory and his love. And he proved it upon the cross. And so you should have a communion cup on your seat today. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you believe 
that he rose from the grave and he conquered our sin. Go ahead and take this out. And if you need one, you can raise your hand. We have crew leaders um, available that can give you one. I want to make sure everybody has one. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You won't go hungry again. And we see this at the Lord's Last Supper, John 10, 18. Jesus said, no one can take my life from me. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some of the bread and blessed it. Then it says that he broke it into pieces and he gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat it. This, this is my body. I know we're still handing out some real quick. I'm gonna let them make sure they can get one. We got one over here too. We do this in remembrance of Christ, a fulfillment of his love for you. Let us pray. God, we thank you, Jesus, so much for your body that was broken for us, for your love for us, that you came to change our lives and give us better attitudes that glorify you. We're not controlled by the things we used to be controlled by, but you have set us free instead. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may eat the bread. And in Matthew 26, verse 27, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. But listen to this. Mark my words, Jesus stated, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood for us, for bringing us a redemptive life. Thank you, Jesus. Let us be consumed by you and not this world. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have you stand right here. And I want to ask our crew team to come up front, our prayer team, because I don't know what you're going through. And listen, I, I understand it's a busy day. And you maybe have plans right now with your family, and, and you should celebrate today. But right now, where are you with Jesus? Have you been running away? Do you feel hurt in this moment? Do you feel like maybe you're going through some suffering and you don't understand? Do you feel like your relationships are falling apart? Do you feel like you're trying to do the best that you can, but you're just, just not satisfied, not fulfilled? Only by running to Jesus can you feel that peace and that joy. And so right now, what we would love to do is pray over you. And if you've never accepted Christ, we would love to pray over you right now so that you can know Jesus in a better way, in a powerful way. So let us worship his holy name before we leave. And if you need prayer, do not hesitate. Hey, if you enjoyed today's sermon and would like to be part of Authentic Church, go ahead and take the next step and sign up for our next steps online. You can live anywhere in the world and still be part of Authentic Church. Also, I want to say thank you so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to either subscribe or follow to any of our social media accounts so that you can see any new content that will be uploaded. And if you'd like to give to this church to help us financially, go ahead and click that Give button down below to help us reach more people for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.